panel a day, it takes really just breaking down these barriers, both in person and virtually, to connect and really drive forward what we see as the future workforce, not only globally, but especially here in Miami, if we're going to take on big problems facing our community. So with us today, we have an incredible panel uh, spanning academia, government, and the, and the private sector, which really is, you know, the diversity of perspectives that's important across the issues that we're going to talk about in the So I will kick things off and throw it to Joan, Dr. Joan Fitzgerald at Northeastern University of UNS from Cape Cod to share a little bit of her work and introduce herself. Hi, I'm here. Oh, uh, I was going to say, would you like to share a little bit about your work that, that you do at Northeastern? Sure. I'm a professor in the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs, and my work is on cities and climate change. I focus on cities in North America and Europe, and I mostly focus on climate mitigation issues, and I link everything I do to equity and economic opportunity. But recently, I led a team that did an assessment of Boston's climate action for the Boston Foundation. And one aspect of that that I focused on was adaptation, in particular, coastal resilience. And so it is with that hat that I'm speaking with you tonight. But just to do a little plug um, for myself, I'm currently working on a book um, called Cities and, and the Struggle for Climate Justice with Oxford University Press. And my last article was with the Journal of the American Planning Association looking at five cities that updated their climate action plans into climate equity or climate justice plans. And that is what I think is the direction of where we should be going on climate action in cities. I think it's an important point also just to mention that you know, climate change, addressing climate change is not just a scientific or policy issue, it is a human issue as well. And we're going to explore that as well today. Um, I'll throw it over to Patrice and I'll blow the presentation. Okay. So good evening, everyone. Um, first of all, I just wanted to ask, who sure. here has been to the underline? Maybe 20% or something. So I first want to kick off with a please come visit. Um, our first phase is in Gribble right now. We want to meet the Miami Metro Rail. And I have a few slides that come to me quick. I also want to take this moment to introduce our Chief Innovation Officer, Jay Moskowitz. And it's working here, you know, Jay, so that's uh, no need to introduce her. But he is doing some amazing things with climate technology through something we're calling the Linear Lab. I'll get to more of that in just a second. So there's the first phase. Uh, we have a half mile open. The next slide. Uh, so we can really are. I'm doing my best. Um, and ultimately, we'll be 10 miles long, 120 acres of open space running beneath the Miami Metro Rail and connecting all of Miami. Next slide. But what our founder likes to say is uh, big projects solve big problems. And that's why we are not only a safety issue uh, where we, you can bike and walk safely, but also we are a resilience project. So we have more than 500,000 native plants and trees that will be planted by the time of the Next slide. So here, she, here you can see the three uh, phases. Phase one and Gribble half mile finish. Phase two, 2.2 additional miles that will take to Southwest 19th Avenue will be finished by the end of this year. And then phase three, that last seven miles will be finished by 2026. We do have some open uh, let's see, some public meetings coming up at the end of this month. We have some flyers somewhere in here, so please come join us. Because there's going to be some amazing things uh, in phase three. Microforests, uh, let's see, skate parks, bioswales. Next slide. Um, but we also want to talk about our community impact. So already within the first two years of operation, we've had 1.5 million annual visitors. We get more than 200 free programs every year. We have a $2 million annual operating budget. But what's really cool, we also offer free Wi-Fi for all of our visitors. So we're seeing about 12,000 annual users, but we know that number is going to keep Something that we like to say is you'll meet somebody new when you're on the underline. More than 60% of our visitors are saying they are meeting these people when they come to the underline. And we think that's a really important piece, especially post-COVID, with that isolation that's taking place. So people are coming with their dog, with their children, but they're meeting new people when they're here. Next uh, slide. So we are a resilience project, as I mentioned. We are among the highest elevation in Brickle. So what does that mean? It means during uh, an extreme storm event, like the one we had last year, all of that litter ends up on the underline. We are pleased that we're also the first place that's open after those extreme storm events, but there is a lot of cleaning up that we have to do. 
So I mentioned those native plants. I'll be talking about those more later. But those are bringing back native ecosystems, kind of like what you see when you're in the Everglades or when you're in a pine rockland. You're seeing that in the middle circle. So all those cute little butterflies, Atala, Sulphur, and the Monarch, you see at the end. Next slide. So just more of what you're seeing. Uh, beautiful ecosystem. I'll get to more of that later. Next slide. And again, these are block by block, which you can expect to see. Part of this is education as well, which I'll talk about later. Next slide. Next slide. Just wanted to talk a little bit about phase three, or phase two. Next slide. So this is what it looks like today. Next slide. And that's what it's going to look like by the end of this year. Next slide. Uh, what we're really excited about is we're launching our first live swim. So for the first time, we're going to be able to mitigate the impacts of that stormwater runoff and clean that water. So that's all about here everyone. Thank you so much. John, back up here. Michael, feel free to jump in and introduce yourself. Michael Pinto. Um, I'm the CEO and founder of Stratagerius Consulting. Uh, we are a management consulting firm based here in Miami. And uh, most of our work focuses on strategic planning, development, uh, business development, kind of how that relates to uh, initiatives that take place. So we focus on everything from uh, environmental quality, uh, business, how that kind of intersects with sustainability, resilience, uh, one of the things that uh, Patrice mentioned, mitigation, uh, and why that's so important. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, that has an impact on critical infrastructure sectors. And so um, it's, a, it's a pretty interesting uh, line of work. We do a little bit of everything, jack of all trades. Uh, we try to be master of all of them. Uh, but we also work with partnerships and making sure that we have the appropriate teams to work on the projects that we have. So um, we're big on uh, saying that the strength of what we do is based on our network and our ability to interface with uh, the community, interface with professionals, People that have ideas and kind of bring those ideas to reality uh, within the community. So um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward. I, I also um, am on the board of directors uh, for Seaworthy, so uh, contributing there, trying to help mentor uh, startups and mentor uh, those that want to get involved with the program. And again, it's just uh, something that we're very passionate about and again looking forward to, uh, to providing. I have to push you, Michael. I have to share a little bit on the government side of what you've done as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, previously my background is, is in uh, critical infrastructure sustainability, uh, so I worked uh, for FEMA for a number of years. Um, I have a program management um, certification that allows me to bring my uh, the expertise in critical infrastructure sectors like bridges, uh, roadways, stormwater systems, anything that's considered uh, one of the 17 critical infrastructure systems that uh, operate municipally uh, from the public sector. Um, and as well, I've worked with uh, USAID, the Agency for International Development, which is housed in uh, the Department of State, again, working on uh, what is the CDQ, or the Council for Environments and Quality, uh, with the White House, and all the uh, federal agencies that bring uh, together their subject matter expertise on how we can implement climate strategy, sustainability, resilience, adaptation, um, and why all those things are important, not just domestically, but also in the world. Now, now I feel like I need to do justice. So, all right. Um, so with that, I'm going to jump into some questions, and we'll save some time at the end for Q&A. But again, the whole point is we're going to hang out for the night, and this is really just to help spark discussion. So first question, I'll throw it back to you, Dr. Fitzgerald. For those who may be unfamiliar with the field, let's start with the basics. What does coastal resilience mean to you, and how does your work expand efforts in this space? Okay, am I on? Yes, you're good. Okay, good. Well, welcome everyone. I'm sorry I couldn't be there live. This is very exciting to have a Miami campus at Northeastern University, and I look forward to lots of collaboration in the future. I think um, one of the first things we have to do is distinguish between climate adaptation and coastal resilience. So coastal resilience refers to protecting shorelines from sea level rise, while adaptation includes other areas such as urban heat islands, storm flooding, which could happen at the coast and in, in coastal uh, inland, wildfires, and so forth. So 
adaptation is a much broader category than coastal um, protection. Um, I recently completed a, an analysis for the Boston Foundation on whether Boston is going to achieve its goals both in climate adaptation and in climate resilience. And I'm going to talk to you tonight about the resilience and how I think that relates to the work you're doing in Miami as well. So when you talk about sea level rise, there's two factors at play. First is salt water is and it can be destructive to electrical systems, plumbing systems, and other critical infrastructure. Because ocean water is, for all intents and purposes, practically infinite as it relates to cities and flooding, you just can't store it somewhere to protect ourselves. So low-lying coastal areas can become flood pathways, and the ocean comes in beyond the coast and into inward parts of the city. So again, my work on the assessment for Boston um, suggests that there's several barriers to coastal resilience. And so let me start by saying, at some levels, Massachusetts and Florida aren't comparable. Massachusetts has about 1,500 miles of coast. You have a much bigger problem to address there. But in both cases, we have to prioritize and within cities. And so among our findings were that there were three major barriers to coastal protection in US cities. First of all, most of the coastline of most cities is privately owned. So looking at Boston, we have about 350 individual parcels on 47 miles of the shoreline. And so when you consider we have 78 cities and towns on the coastline, protection cannot be addressed by individual private property owners or even municipal uh, or county governments on their own. Um, because each of them has their own interests, their own decision-making um, time frame. So the private ownership is one barrier to a comprehensive solution. The second one, which is not unrelated to that first one, has to do with the jurisdictional limits. So whether you're talking about constructed, constructed infrastructure or nature-based solutions, you have to get permitting. And that usually requires um, permitting from um, state agencies, federal agencies, it may be the Army Corps of Engineers. It's really a complex array, array depending on exactly what you want to do, which agency you go to. Um, and that approach can't respond to regional challenges and it can't really assess the urgency of particular areas of that. So there's a misalignment of goals among agencies. Many of the water and uh, protection agencies were developed in the 70s. Climate change wasn't even on the agenda. And so part of the problem is, do we have to have a, a discrepancy between protecting life in the water versus protecting coastlines. And that's very much up to play. Well, let me, and let me the, oh, I was going to say, if I, could, I just want to make sure I make time for the other panelists to answer some of the questions as well. We're, we're going to come back to some of these other questions you're already uh, answering, Dr. Mitchell. So. Oh, should I stop? I, I was going to say, <laughs> I know you're answering some of the other questions, so I want to make sure we have time to get back to them, if that's OK. okay may I just make one yeah, quick point? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so the third, the only 31, third one I wanted to deal with is that no city or town anywhere has raised enough private or public funds to comprehensively address coastal protection. And so again, jurisdictional limits, private ownership of land, lack of funding are the three major problems uh, preventing us from having effective solutions to coastal infrastructure protection. I think we, we, uh, we, we, have, we jumped ahead for a couple of questions, but I think you guys are getting a thorough overview here and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll jump back and forth between. So I'll throw it back uh, to Patrice uh, to talk about you know, just what either, we can, we can do the first two. So you can either say as far as what coast resilience means to you or 
uh, what ad the difference with adaptation as well. Okay, uh, so I'm an urban planner, and it's not my doctor, Fitzgerald is too, and so part of a job, your job as an urban planner is fixing past problems, you know, whether it's making up for a highway that dissected a neighborhood, or shrinking a road because it's way too far to begin with. Coastal resilience and adaptation is very similar. It's more focused on adaptation at the underline, but we're repurposing 10 miles of land in the metro rail that's that neglected. And we're looking at how to do that in a way that don't require uh, irrigation or fertilization. We're making sure that we're building micro forests, which means hundreds of trees very close together in an urban area that create a biodiversity that isn't those things that we did over the past 100 years with development. And so it's pretty exciting, but it's also a very challenging time. So Michael, as far as the, either what coast resilience means to you, or as far as some of the differences between coast resilience and adaptation? Yeah, I think um, my, my fellow panelists touched on it really well. Um, adaptation is Again, from from uh, our, my standpoint and others that I work with, is kind of recognizing that the, the issue exists. Whereas resiliency deals with anticipating the risks, um, finding ways to mitigate the risks, finding solutions to kind of um, be anticipatory in the way that that that, uh, that takes place, um, and then also getting into what recovery looks like, because the reality is, as we all know. Uh, climate change is real. We know that there's a 66% chance that we're going to hit that 1.5 Celsius uh, mark within the next, they say, four to five years or so. Uh, so storms are going to get more intense, and more complicated, more frequent, and more hazardous, and more catastrophic when it comes to handling. So resilience is an important thing to focus on because there will always be a need to respond but also to recover from these events that are going to keep happening for the foreseeable future. And that's kind of where we kind of focus on those critical infrastructures, how we put uh, policy, education, things like that into those, uh, those thoughts. Um, obviously, there are barriers to that, as, as uh, Joel mentioned and, and Patrice, but uh, really focusing on how we can develop those solutions is really going to be key in the next uh, three, to, three to five years. Or two. Well, I want to dig into those barriers a little more, and I know Dr. Fitzgerald mentioned some, but I'm curious as far as, from your experience, what you've seen as what those barriers are. Is it just policy or what else? How does it do much uh, from, a, from a regulatory standpoint without policy? That's why uh, it started in Washington, it started with uh, local governments, municipalities, but um, a big one is education. We're not educated, so most people are educated and they, they hear different things on different subjects, but education is a very key component to how we get to policy because it's down to, when we talk about citizen science, but even down to young people, uh, the way that we're getting involved with schools and others. So uh, making it cultural, making it something that's accessible to people is very key. I just wanted to add regulation in general is really needed just speaking to somebody about uh, recycling glass and how difficult that is here in Miami Dade. Miami Dade actually beats the country in several areas, and one of them is our code. Because of our hurricane, we have the best building code in the nation. So we can lead the nation in coastal resilience, but when you go to try to get something as simple as a living shoreline built, it's impossible. I tried for three years when I worked for the Miami DEA, which Kevin yeah, there you are, Kevin. Um, and was told repeatedly you can't do it. And, and it's just such a shame. We actually invested in a study with AutoPace to show every dollar spent on a living shoreline has a five to one return. So meaning it's going to save that much in buildings and property, whatever you want to call it. It's going to really provide a great ROI. And there's, it's near impossible to get that. Well, I, I know between the uh, shoreline talk and as well as the, the uh, barriers to glass recycling, I got a number of, uh, a, a bunch of empathy in the room, to say the least. Uh, Dr. Fitzgerald, was there anything you wanted to expand on the barriers? I know I had to, had to cut you off there, but. Yeah, um, I, I really want to focus on this equity issue that was raised in that I think 
it comes to the forefront in Miami a lot. So Miami is home to about a quarter of the nation's homes at risk for rising seas. Um, so we're talking about somewhere between 15 and $23 billion of property. So if you look at Miami-Dade's middle-class residents, they are very much you know, in danger of losing the wealth that they have accumulated in their homes because property values are going to go down as the risk of water inundation rises. And then you have to look at the low-income communities that didn't have access to the coastal areas that were, that were um, you know, with the most property, you know, the value. And they had to locate inland and on high ground, right? And so already you see them fighting against developers who are saying, oh my goodness, we have to move to higher ground in Miami. And so I looked to a Yale 360 article um, that put this disparity into context. So South Florida in general has about 35 billionaires, which is about 5% of the U.S. total. The minimum wage in Miami is $8.56 an hour. And so if you look at this as a relative rate of inequality, it's similar to developing countries like Paraguay, Colombia. And so if you, if you take in the fact that 40% of the households in Miami-Dade, of which Miami is a part, of course, are working poor with little savings and few assets, um, these economic divisions are racial divisions, and this is going to be at the forefront of how Miami-Dade decides how they're going to do coastal resilience. There's a certain amount of building wonderful swales in inland areas, but ultimately there's going to have to be some retreat in Miami. And I think there's going to be real conflicts about who gets to uh, live here in, uh, in which properties. Well, and I, I think there's a key term, especially we're right now in Little River, uh, you know, this is one of the sites of climate gentrification. It's a real thing. This is Little Haiti. It's also the high ground in Miami. Those you don't know. Yeah. Um, so it's it's literally around us, at where we are, and you know it's it's a real issue that I think when we talk climate in Miami, there have been case studies about it. You know, the University of Michigan did one uh, as far as what it looks like here and how it's evolving. And uh, you know, this isn't some far out issue that a lot of people like to think about in climate, but something that's already happening right here. Right but I think it's really important. Let's, let's dig deeper on this on the equity lens here. Um, as far as you know, what are some of the challenges and opportunities for coastal coast resilience and adaptation, in creating a more equitable urban Go ahead. Uh, well, first of all, we're focused on adaptation for adapting underlying and opportunities that we have here uh, in Miami is an educated workforce, a climate educated workforce. It, it's kind of the terminology that um, I guess I, I, I coined, but again, when we talk about the importance of education, if, you're, if your workforce is not educated around climate, around the impact that, that takes place, again, these are places we live, we work here, we, we, we 
came out here, we build our families, our legacies here. Uh, if the workforce that is existing now and then coming subsequently is not educated, then we're doing a disservice to, to the community from a long-term standpoint. Um, and that goes back to education. That goes back to the responsibility that comes with education. This is not just something like Daniel mentioned that we can kind of turn a blind eye to or pretend it's not going to exist or it's not going to happen. It's just the reality of, of the world that we live in. It's the world that uh, your children, your grandchildren, and subsequent legacies will have to, to, to cope with. So the more that we can educate the workforce, uh, modernize what that looks like, modernize how we uh, bring that education to the workforce, that places the responsibility on us, but it also gives an opportunity for growth to happen. Um, there is a disparity. We know that it's going to take uh, policy, other things, operations to do that, but um, I think that's a really key point that you, that you touched on there. A climate-educated workforce, a climate-educated community that understands, hey, there's opportunity here, but it's also a call to action and responsibility on our part as well. And I think uh, one of the points on the seaworthy one side here, you know, in the marine sciences, is my, my background, you know, so there are more degrees than there are jobs. Most of the traditional pathway leads people to either working in the public sector or working in academia. And obviously, you know, we need another path if we're going to really solve these problems. The necessity for entrepreneurship to create the businesses, to create the jobs, right, for the future of this workforce as well. And so it's part of why we're here. We're turning over to Q&A. If you have for anyone looking to get involved in coastal resilience or adaptation work in South Florida and beyond. Well, I think the key thing for anyone wanting to get involved is to really understand our way out of this. We can't recycle our way out of this. In Miami and many coastal cities, sea, level, sea levels are rising and you've got infiltration of salt water. And so there has to be a level of planning at the state and regional level coordinated there has to be a level of funding and financing. There has to be engineering capacity and regulatory authority to address these problems. And I, I mean, I think the education aspect that's been mentioned is really important, but the equity aspect of this is absolutely essential. So it can't be we're going to move in but we'll move into the high areas that, that poor communities are in. So trying to figure out the equity issue um, and the engagement issue so that it's easy to get caught up in technology for technology's sake. I know it's just kind of like heresy in this happy hour, but first figure out what the problem is you're trying to solve. There's a Chinese proverb that I all heard it, when's the best time to have planted a tree 20 years ago? When's the best, second best time today? I have to give a shout out to Maria Alonso over here who leads the Miami uh, campus of Northeastern University. She and I planted trees seven or eight years ago, and so proud to say that we invested. But you have to keep it simple. I mean, litter is contributing to our marine decline, and planting trees are two very simple jobs that you can get started on today. Uh, and then lastly, come visit the underline. We do have tons of educational opportunities. Fairchild even cites this as a great place just to figure out what you want to plan for your backyard. So if it's surviving on the underline, you can put it in your backyard. I can swear by it to give you a tour today. <laughs> Yeah, guys, um, I, I like what Patrice said. I like uh, what, what John said. And, um, I would add to that um, intentionality, be intentional. Um, the things that we're doing here, we're here tonight because uh, we care. We're, we care about what's going on. We're educating ourselves. We're learning from each other. Um, Joan presented amazing, amazing information that um, helps to educate me. It helps me to be more intentional as well. So it's, it's an ongoing process. Um, it's not something that's going to just change overnight, but um, along with, with the things that, that Joan and, and Patrice mentioned, be intentional. Um, we all are scientists. We don't have to have a, a biology or a chemistry degree. This is science and it affects us. So citizen science is, is, is important to understand how well we do impacts. And uh, when we do that, and, we, and again, there's, there's 
a lot more obviously we can we can talk about more than just in this 45 minutes but um be intentional keep it simple like you said it's all work cut out but unification is what's going to help us do this regardless of race color language all, all of that we're all kind of in the same world together yeah. and this one there all right, uh, so at this point, we're opening up to you guys. Uh, I'm going to bring the microphone so that way you can hear as well. Um, so uh, I see two hands in the middle back there. All right, uh, do you want to finish my passing this back? And if you want to introduce yourself, go ahead. Hi, I'm Caitlin Gimbel. Um, uh, my question is I think about 80% of the world's biodiversity is actually taken care of by indigenous communities, leaders. Um, obviously, Colombia is not far away. Uh, North America, we have plenty of indigenous leaders here, also Africa. I had the opportunity to work with amazing African leaders. So are we inviting a single table for communities because the uh, Western conservation approaches aren't working? I can take a stab at it first. So um, that's a great question. Uh, the answer is we should be. Uh, we should be, I, I can speak to on the federal side in, in, my, in my experience, um, whenever disasters take place or planning takes place both on the federal and, and the municipal uh, level, even, even in my role when I'm asked to consult or be of assistance uh, to corporations, uh, that is a requirement is to have uh, indigenous, uh, indigenous populations represented. In particular, I can speak to uh, when disasters take place, actually indigenous uh, populations get their own declaration. So they have their own, uh, for example, if a, if a hurricane takes place here, or there's planning that takes place here, there will be two separate disaster declarations, one for the state of Florida and then one for each individual tribe or people that are, that are affected by that from a federal recognition standpoint. That plays a major role domestically, of course, I can speak to, but also on the international side uh, with the Agency for International Development and some of the, the, the stakeholders that I, I know in there that we're working together. That's part of what creates the ability for a, a, a country or a, a population of people in a particular country to be able to be self-sustaining. It's teaching them, as the proverb talks about, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, and if you teach a man a fish, you feed him for a lifetime. So that is a very critical component uh, that it doesn't get a lot of press, per se. You don't hear about it a lot, but uh, that is something that is, is actively implemented, but it does need to be more at the forefront. Um, yeah, I, I mean really leadership roles, because their approaches are very different. Their mindsets, the way they would approach a situation is very, very different. It's really more leadership. And, and I will tell you, even on the international side, that is the biggest component. Whenever, whenever a corporation or a government goes into a into a, an area, the leaders are the ones that are trained to actually take the initiative with the support. So it's not, you know, the government or that NGO or that particular corporation is going to do all the work. They will train the leaders to actually take the lead in it. So that way. Once, it's, once that support is removed away, it's operating on a more sustainable level. But that's, again, those are or in the press per se, but that, that is a component of what has to happen. Because without that, then there still is that reliance on the support as opposed to creating that sustainable um, leadership and being able to carry it forward. Um, I can just touch on this real quick. Uh, so you know, there's basically sustainability has kind of been a thing for a while. We're seeing you know, the shift toward a regenerative movement. Hopefully, if you've been to a SeaWorld event before, you might have heard that word. Um, it's about really going and solving problems at the root, but also really inclusive stakeholder leadership, right? And so what we're actually seeing is, especially in, in leadership positions, we have a lot to learn from indigenous wisdoms. They lived sustainably long before we ever did, and we're still trying to get anywhere near as close as they've been, right? And so, you know, they, like you talk, you hear nature-based solutions, you mentioned that tonight, right? They've been doing that long, long before we have. And so it's understanding the actual, not only cultural value, but actually real knowledge that they have that we have to learn from because we have to get back to that if our planet is going to be sustainable. So just want to agree with that. Great, great question. Can you know, comment briefly on that? Yeah, absolutely. I think the key thing is whether it's indigenous or whether it's black 
indicators of accountability. Not only who's participating in, in setting up the goals, but what those goals are and how we're achieving them rather than just saying, you know, everyone's participating, we need to learn from these groups. It's all about measurement and accountability that, that we ultimately determine whether that has been the case. I'm uh, Matias Acosta. I'm not from Miami. I just came uh, with an award from the U.S. Department of State. And uh, yeah, great and insightful talk. Thank you, everyone. I was wondering, um, so 18% of the greenhouse emissions will come actually from uh, cooling energy demand. And um, I, I'm actually with a, with a backpack because I bring a jacket everywhere. I have been freezing and there's a very few studies actually that there's a substantial overcooling in the U.S. happening. Like, pretty much around 15, 20% of the energy is being wasted right now. And um, I'm wondering, well, first, whether there's some general considerations of urban plan planning, let's say, in Miami. So you can make sure, and that's what the underline is doing, is to get as many trees as possible so people aren't having to walk in the sun. So you can reduce the amount of trees that are being cut down by about 20 trees a And, and needs to be addressed, but until you address the coastal resilience is the biggest issue here in Miami. Uh, I think we have time for one or two more. Let's go ahead the first person. <laughs> Hi, my name is Tomas, and you guys all mentioned that uh, regulation is, uh, is actually kind of a, a barrier for, for the progress in, in, in this area. How, how do we, what way is that? How do we, how do we get around it? You know, what's the solution? How do we start working on, on a solution? As a resident and, and then as entrepreneurs and, and uh, yeah. You know, I think uh, Mayor Levine Kava is really trying to make some inroads there. You know, she has the world's living first. Um, she does have the chief resilience officer. And so, you know, and example I gave about living shorelines, we did go to that, and it's a very complicated issue. I mean, I made it sound like oh, we're just saying that. It's, it's extremely complicated, but I think we need to empower, you know, some sort of resilient czar or somebody who really uh, embraces innovation. I mean, look at how many people here are working for a climate technology or a climate startup. Just raise your hand. I mean, a lot. So I think, you know, getting these people in a room To that point um, as well, I'll speak to just some of the experience I've had. Um, regulation is a, is a tricky thing because of helping, and again, we, we go back to this concept of education. It's not a problem until it's a problem, right? It's not an issue until it's, until it's an issue. The, uh, the things that are considered antiquated by way of infrastructure aren't a problem until they become a problem, right? So. Um, it, it's, it's raising, but also too, um, I can tell you that from working with Miami Dade County in the past, um, having conversations with, with individuals that are, that are in leadership roles, it may not be exactly in their scope of, of view at the moment. So again, it's, it's helping them understand when we spend money on mitigation, when we spend money toward things that are going to actually improve process because as long as there are laws that govern the way things are done, policy and regulation will always play a role in that and that's going to be something that 
um, is going to be contended. I'll close with just this little uh, note. The federal government does understand there are, they are their own worst enemy when it comes to regulation. So they say, hey, we can't do a lot of the good things that need to happen because of red tape, because of politics, or this side of the aisle, that side of the aisle. So we need the private sector. The private sector and, and people that are involved and on the front lines are what drive innovation, are what drive the change. So as long as that's there, basically three, five, seven, ten years, with the support of the private sector. That's why things like this are so important. Things that empower driving of regulation and policy because that's how it's gonna be done. They understand that, but it's up it's up to the private sector to push a lot of that and to really really push that change to happen. May I count that a little bit Absolutely. in that let's look at coastal resilience. Um, the coastline is a is a continuous entity. You can't have private property a regulatory approach where we're figuring out how to protect the coastline. That can't be done at the individual level, property owner level. Well, I think we're gonna end here, but before before we wrap up, I wanna invite Kevin and Maria Alonzo to come up here. We really, really could not do this without not only our panelists, but also our partners at North Eastern. So I want to say thank you to all of you for being a part of this. this was Thanks, you're great.